writer's cramp is a uh, focal dystonia of the hand, which uh, generally just appears in the context of writing. Writer's cramp is a condition in which the hand is completely normal doing anything else other than writing. When a patient picks up the pen to write, the hand would adopt a, an abnormal posturing so that writing control is totally lost. Oromandibular dystonia affects the jaw muscles, lips, and tongue. It causes the jaw to be held open or clamped shut, making eating, swallowing, or speaking very difficult. All of these focal dystonias affect one muscle group or region of the body. However, they can and do often occur in combination, making dystonia complex and at times difficult to diagnose. Most dystonia is a diagnosis that you really make by history and examination. Those are the two pieces you have to do for every patient. Okay, pick them up. Spread your fingers. It's very much a clinical diagnosis where uh, the, the clinician is uh, familiar with these patterns of uh, movement. A neurologist who's experienced and knows one movement disorder versus another can recognize the characteristic features uh, of the movements that say this is a dystonic disease in contrast to say to this is a chorique disease, this is a myoclonic disease, uh, or say a bradykinetic disease where there's too little movements. So one has to be somewhat of an expert uh, in neurology to know how to diagnose dystonia. One of our jobs as uh, uh, movement disorder specialists is to help educate primary care doctors about things like dystonia. There's no single blood test. You can't screen the population with a single test that will say you have dystonia, you don't have dystonia. It's not that kind of a problem. On the other hand, Certain genetic forms of dystonia you can now determine by the gene itself. So you can do a genetic test. For example, the gene that we know about, DYT1, uh, is able to be tested for. The discovery of the DYT1 gene is perhaps the most dramatic recent breakthrough in the field of dystonia research. Leading the way in supporting and coordinating this effort to find the genetic links and better treatments for dystonia is the Dystonia Medical Research Foundation. I think what's important to know, first of all, about the Dystonia Medical Research Foundation is that we address all forms of dystonia. We know that there are at least seven inherited forms. We know that there are seven or six focal dystonias. We know there are secondary dystonias. And what we've tried to do is to create literature that will address each one of those forms of dystonia. The primary focus of the foundation is to support research, to support patients, and to educate the medical and the lay community. Research, awareness and education, and support. These are the three ways the Dystonia Medical Research Foundation coordinates the effort to treat and eventually cure dystonia. All three of these goals converge every few years when the foundation sponsors an international symposium where hundreds of researchers, physicians, and patients gather to share the latest developments in dystonia research. That to me is the most important part of the foundation, to supply the manuals and the vehicles and the symposiums for persons, whatever form of dystonia they have. Then it might just be called a focal hand dystonia. I think that these uh, meetings uh, with the doctors interacting with the patients are just terrific. The more that we learn, the more that we hear from patients, uh, the better in terms of uh, trying to understand the broad spectrum. Every little clue may be helpful. In addition to hosting these symposiums, the Dystonia Medical Research Foundation has funded more than 300 research grants, totaling over $15 million, funds that have yielded promising results. I think genetics is, is pioneering a, a new era in the field of dystonia. The genetics part is uh, being understood at a very rapid rate now because of the breakthroughs in our uh, understanding of DNA and the s sequencing of genetic material. The genetics have helped us because, number one, we can help make a diagnosis in somebody we're not certain about. Number two, we can provide genetic counseling for families who are interested in family planning. And finally, having identified a gene allows us to find out what that gene does wrong. More genes are going to be discovered. And with the discovery of the genes, we're learning what the abnormal proteins they have, and that is giving us clues as to how perhaps to do research and come, come up with better treatments for dystonia. Treatments are a major focus of the dystonia research effort. The goal is to find therapies with minimum side effects that improve the quality of life for those coping with dystonia. 
Since there is at present no cure for dystonia, most treatments are symptomatic and attempt to cover up or relieve the dystonic spasms. Probably the biggest breakthrough is the use of botulinum toxin uh, for the treatment of uh, focal dystonias. And recent developments have led to two types of botulinum toxin, botulinum toxin A and botulinum toxin B. Overactive muscles are identified, given injections with botulinum toxin, and the overactivity reduced. It's a, a symptomatic treatment, clearly. The uh, basic disease is not altered in any way, uh, but it can be extremely helpful to patients. Unfortunately, for generalized dystonia, the, uh, a large amount of toxin might be required, and this may be toxic to the body, and it is not practical uh, to give such treatment to generalized dystonia. So we still rely on a list of oral medications. There are many medicines that are available for the treatment of dystonia. These medications include things such as artane, that's an anticholinergic, a big word, but basically what it means is that it changes the messenger system in that deep part of the brain. And by changing the messenger system, these drugs make it so that dystonia can be improved. Other medications include things such as baclofen, liorisol, cinemet, tetrabenazine. There are a variety of medicines that are now available, which have been shown in some studies to improve the symptoms of dystonia. The other form of treatment that is just being explored now is brain surgery. This is already quite clearly useful in Parkinson's disease, and uh, similar methodologies are being applied in the area of dystonia. We still don't like to do brain surgery first. First, we like to try medicines and other more conservative approaches. But if they fail and the person's quality of life is bad, we can certainly go ahead and suggest brain surgery for the patient. One has to trade off all these risks and benefits. And the risks here are actually very small. Uh, and the benefits are enormous. I think that it um, fell out of favor to some extent in the past because of uh, very significant side effects and because of difficulties in actual surgical localization. But today we're much more sophisticated. We have computers that guide the electrodes. We have a better understanding of the physiology of the brain. We know which targets to go to more accurately and to control dystonia that way. The other surgeries other than stimulation and uh, pallidotomy, uh, there are the local uh, partial denervations and uh, myectomies that are being done. Uh, those can be certainly effective for focal uh, dystonias. More and more neurosurgeons are learning the technique and uh, hopefully uh, every country will be uh, able to, to do the technique so the patients can benefit. Whether that will uh, turn out to be very useful for large numbers of people in the end is not clear. It's still very early days in that regard, but it's another very exciting uh, area for current research. The great hope with dystonia is that since you have a, I think, a very discrete motor control abnormality, um, it will be easy to fix or more easily totally fixable. Or a cure is actually a cure is possible.